and tells us what it's like to have a nation overtaken, his nation, and what it was like to be thrown into a prison. He says, I was held in a cell for 10 people, but there was a hundred. And he said, they used to take us out, line us up against the wall, pull out their guns and shoot. This was their game, he said. Mm -hmm. He said, sometimes their guns were loaded and sometimes they weren't, but either way we died. I went up and sat at his foot. I sat by his feet. I had to look at him because I thought this was over. I thought my father fought the last great war and that there would never be another Holocaust or an Anne Frank. And all of a sudden I knew it would go on and on and on, Robin. That was my pivotal beginning. That was my pivotal beginning. It's right amazing there. at 12 and 13, isn't it? And I decided right there I would become a military historian. Right there at age 12. And from that moment on, I became a military historian, which I am. That was when I decided. I said, what is it about human nature? Mm. And that opened my soul. It wasn't these grandiose questions about, gee, I wonder why you feel but No. I wanted to understand evil, and that opened my soul. What is your understanding of evil? That it's the most seductive force on the planet. That it is far more a seductive force than people are ever, ever aware of. That it exists, rather absolutely exists. I once um, uh, saw a movie and they defined it as the absence of empathy. Oh, that's one way. Mm. That there's no, no connection with another person. That's one way. That is one way that, that can cause a person to conduct evil. But it's real. It's real. It is a force as real as life itself. And it, it intrigues me what, what drives people to acts of evil versus choosing in that same moment an act of compassion and why people fear compassion but don't fear evil and that fascinates me and so I became a medical intuitive not for grandiose reasons I probably blew the lid off myself trying to understand the nature of the soul and why people are driven to or attracted to such extremes of darkness when such extremes of light are so available. Hold that because we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and find out some more about, I certainly want to know some more about what you have discovered from that. Stay with us. Welcome back, and we're having a fascinating conversation here with Carolyn Mace. You were saying before the break about evil and compassion. Can you just share more of what you've learned, why you have, what you ha, what you found out about why people seem to, in in your experience, your understanding, go more towards evil than compassion? Because you had a heck of an introduction to that at twelve and thirteen. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, before you answer that, you said that your 
that your childhood was formed by your father being a Marine. What was your belief system before these books that came into your life because your dad was a Marine? Well, my dad was the most honorable good man I knew. Mm -hmm. um, impeccable. He was, it was an impeccable man. Um, he was a man of, uh, you know, a Marine's a disciplined character. Um, but he was, he was influenced by the war, World War II, you know, and, and I knew that my dad was in, in every Christmas, he, he got on his knees praying for somebody. And one year I gave him a wallet. Men are very weird. They're attached to their wallets. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> they get real attached to their wallets. And even the more the wallet falls apart, the more they like their wallet. But I gave him a wallet one year, and uh, he pulled out some Japanese money. Mm -hmm. You know, the Marines fought in the Pacific. And there was a bullet hole through it with blood. I was nine years old. I said, what is that? He looked at me and said, this is the first human being I knowingly killed. Oh, wow. And he started to cry. And he left the room. And he got on his knees. And every year, he said a rosary for that, the men that he, he killed. Do you understand the, how that influences a kid? Who want, who, I, I right. could not because I haven't walked in your shoes. However, well, it there is a... It did. And, Some understanding, yeah. And the my and, my and my father said to my mother, "My sons will never fight in a war." But what I have come to believe mm -hmm. is that we are the soul in us. The soul is a vessel drawn to goodness. The ego is a vessel drawn to darkness. And therein lies our battle. Therein lies our battle. Our ego is constantly seduced by, by, by greed, by, because this is, this is the trigger point, Robin. The greatest fear a person has, the greatest injury, the greatest fear, is the fear of being humiliated. People are controlled by that. And if someone humiliates you, you will never forgive them. Never. Never? No. You don't believe that's forgivable? No. Really? For most people. Yeah. For most people. Most people go through their whole lives not being able to forgive somebody who said, I wouldn't be caught dead in this red shirt. Oh my God. Oh my God. Right? Humiliation controls people. It determines how you dress. It determines whether or not you take a job. Mm -hmm. It determines where you sit on a plane. It determines how dare I not be first to get on a stuffy old plane. <laughs> how everything is humiliation. Everything. And that's the ego. And a humiliated ego is a weapon. Make no mistake. It is a weapon. And the ego is so fragile, so fragile, that you could set somebody off by looking at them the wrong way. And then they're lost. And they're fragile for the rest of their lives. And it takes therapy and drugs and medication and pillows that they have to beat and God knows what else, and you still can't get them out of it. You still can't get them out of it. Oh, those poor things. But the soul in them, this is why they're in so much pain. The soul in them knows that yeah, yeah. love and liberation is their highest calling. And they long to get there. They long to get there. And the hardest thing is to get over that sense of hubris.